I think we'll get started. It's, uh, we'll start on time and uh, see how we can do about finishing on time. Um, I'm Lauren Smiller. I've uh, been asked to chair this event. Um, and I'm delighted that we've got a, um, the opportunity to, to run this. Uh, Senator Kate Lundy, who's sitting in the middle of the, the, the three people um, on the panel, is, um, has been a, a prime mover in um, the way Australia has been using, Australian government has been using and adopting information and digital technology for a long time, firstly in opposition and uh, now in government. Um, and uh, the, the, the earlier this year, the, there was an event called the Public Sphere, which was championed by you, I think, and uh, used, used the opportunity to generate a whole community set of interest about how government could operate better. Um, and over in Australia, I've been tracking the, uh, the Government 2.0 Task Force, and a lot of the work that, that Kate championed there has found its way into that task force. And, and there's, a, there's a sense of rolling momentum that's, that's certainly um, taking place in Australia. Um, so Kate is going to talk to us for a period of time. Um, following on from that, Vikram Kumar, who's on the end, who works for the State Services Commission, is going to talk about uh, uh, a, a small amount about what government is doing. Um, the aim of this session, though, is to have a conversation. Um, the third panelist, Brenda Wallace, is um, from the private sector and is a open source champion, hacker, bigot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all, all, all the other good words we associate with uh, changing, changing the shape of the world. Um, this, the audience is roughly 50% government, 50% uh, private sector. Um, and the title for this evening is Three Pillars of Open Government Roles for the 21st Century. And it's in becoming clear that government can't do, manage the information in th that is, is going to be required um, to, to run our societies at, on its own. Government needs to operate in partnership with the private sector and with the third, the third society, um, the NGOs and so on. But it's not clear at the moment what those new roles are. So the aim of this evening is to, is to use the opportunity of uh, Senator uh, being here um, as, as starting a dialogue in New Zealand um, along the, the roles of um, open government in the 21st century. And uh, I hope a number of you will be coming along um, this coming weekend where we've got our first uh, open government bar camp um, taking place on Saturday and the Hackfest on Sunday. I'm told that the, the, the actual um, bar camp on the Saturday is fully subscribed, but um, if, you, if you want to come along to the Hackfest, then uh, um, you'll surely be able. There's three places left, I'm told, from the back of the room um, at the Southern Cross. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to ask Kate to come up and talk to us about um, the three pillars of open government and what's happening in Australia. Thank you very much um, for that lovely welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as you've heard, I want to talk about um, three pillars as I've described them um, for open government. But I just want to do a little bit of scene setting first. Um, one of the things I've been involved in in politics now for, well, about 14 years, and that is the role that technology plays in, in changing what we do. And I've always found myself arguing uh, out the front about how we can better use technology to make governments do their job better and make the services provided to citizens more meaningful. Um, what all that means in the context of ICT policy uh, for governments is to actually grasp the central role and importance of ICT in enabling a whole range of things. And I, I consistently found myself arguing that until uh, po the political leadership, the politicians themselves, um, had enough of a grasp of the power of software, of, of tech, to, to do amazing things, they weren't able to be in a position to come up with the public policies that would make the necessary difference. And you, you, you kind of hit a conceptual wall as a politician envisage, envisaging what the future looked like if you weren't able to sort of co-opt at least a basic understanding of those tech tools. And that, that is essentially still the case. It's still a, a problem. But what needs to happen now is we're going past the point 
of where there is tech out there for a bunch of enthusiasts and people at the forefront of, of industry and the tech sector, and then there's everybody else. Um, what we're experiencing now in the 21st century is that the, the, the social revolution, if you like, ha is catching up with the technology that's available in our society. And just looking at the, the trends of internet connectivity, um, you start to get a sense of the, um, the, the integrated role that the internet is now playing in people's lives. And that, that ought to be changing the, the fundamental thinking of governments and how they uh, serve their citizens, citizens and for politicians, how they represent their constituents. And they're some of the themes I'll be talking about tonight. From Australia's point of view, um, we think we've got some of the, the fundamentals right and can I tell you it's been a long frustrating road in opposition where basic things like having a ubiquitous broadband network um, was, a, was a, a daily political argument, a daily political debate. So to be a part of a government now whose vision for a national broadband network um, that could cost up to $43 billion to be rolled out across Australia with a, a minimum of 100 megabits per second um, connections for 90% of the population. For the first time ever, I find myself in politics saying, I can see a point in time when the digital divide is closed. Now, it will take a few years, but that changes everything as well. Because once the digital divide, you've got a policy to close the digital divide, that frees government up to be able to think in a, in a new way, in a different way about what we use that network for. That will not be um, limited to those who are socioeconomically enabled or who happen to live in the right place that isn't so geographically isolated. We also need to have the skills to allow people to participate but we have a multi-billion dollar digital education revolution investment that is putting com computers in schools, high bandwidth connections in schools and professional development for teachers in Australian schools. So you can start to see we've got some of the basics, we think at least beginning to be covered off through multi-billion dollar investments in what we see as, as both economic and social infrastructure. So just to, to cut across Okay, with, with those things in place, what, how does our thinking need to change as a, as a national government? I'd like to address um, the three, what I call the three pillars of open government um, as in describing what that challenge looks like. Um, the first one, uh, of course, is what it means for citizen-centric services. Uh, the second one, uh, and by that I mean putting the citizen uh, in, the, in the hot seat. We, we, all governments talk about it, but none of us do it very well. Um, what does the, the internet and a range of digital services mean for making that concept of citizen-centric government services real? So that's the first point. The second pillar of open government is facilitating innovation. In a digital environment, and you are probably the best place community to understand the strength of the uh, collaborative network that can be created in a digital environment. Imagine applying that to the way, uh, to the way governments do business, to the way they come up with ideas, to the way they interact with the private sector and not to be afraid of sharing. Uh, what does that do to the way governments do their business? And finally, um, there's the issue of, of open and transparent government and, and this takes on many dimensions, uh, not least of all um, openness and transparency means greater accountability. And if there was one thing that the constituencies of the world in all of our respective democracies are clamouring for, that is greater government accountability and responsiveness to their needs. So I'd like to just work through each of, each of those and use examples of what's going on in Australia um, that start to, I think, service uh, these pillars of open government. And I'll also mention areas that I think we have a lot more work to, to do as well. Um, so first to citizen-centric services. One of the great challenges of the Australian environment is that we have three spheres of government. We have a federated system, we have states and territories, and then we have hundreds and hundreds of local governments 
throughout the country that are governed by um, via a state statute. The links between the federal and the local governments uh, have been uh, in relation to the provision of, of financial resources and very little else. So one of the massive challenges for Australia is to be able to have a level of coordination between the different spheres of government in such a way that, that you as a citizen or a, an Australian citizen is not mired in the mesh of those complex inter, intergovernmental um, and different spheres of government and bureaucratic red tape. And you can appreciate that, that someone wanting to buy a new house and, and get a broadband connection in a new area is, is subject to, to three spheres of government and, and there are rules in each um, that need to be abided by and services in each that need to be accessed. And all of those spheres of government, it won't surprise you, have their own services online, or some. Some don't. Our local government sphere is um, um, far from homogenous in how it functions, and some are very wealthy by virtue of the subdivision, and some are extremely poor to the point of not being financially viable. So there's a, a huge difference in what each of those local governments are able to provide to citizens. From a state perspective, there's a, a raft of fantastic initiatives and others that um, are not so good. And with the federal government, um, each protective of their own brand of sphere of government uh, do their own thing as well. So for each of, for a citizen looking at all of the government services and departments that they need to interact with, there's already three starting points. And that's assuming that each of those three spheres of government have got their act together in an online environment. We can do so much better than that. And one of the things the federal Labor government's trying to do is initiate a far more comprehensive uh, conversation across the three spheres of government just to, in resolving the service delivery complexities. They haven't even got so far yet as to talking about how that could possibly manifest itself online and online service delivery. So we have a way to go. But the thinking is in the right place. The other issue about um, citizen-centric services is um, how, we, how we actually deploy uh, geospatial data and geocode services that are provided by government so citizens can find them in association with where they live and their point of, um, you know, their, their community in the world. And uh, again, it's pretty patchy at the moment, but we have one site that we like to to fly as a bit of a flag uh, as how we can effectively use geocoded data to make information available to citizens in their communities. And that is our stimulus package uh, projects and investments. There's been a, um, a website put together that allows you to tap in your postcode or your, your street or your area and it will come back to whatever's going on around your area. And the idea being that people can be confident that when the government says we're going to be spending so many billions of dollars to stimulate the local economy, that you, as a citizen, have a right to know where that money is being spent and how and why and how it's going. And um, that site, I think, is proving um, to be a, a good example about how you can associate activities of the government with a, a, a geographical location. Um, another, another really good example of um, being more citizen-centric and, and making things available to citizens is another uh, website that um, um, is a particular favourite of me. I should declare I'm on the advisory board of the National Archive of Australia. And um, this particular initiative is called Mapping Our Anzacs. And it allows uh, citizens to go in and essentially populate the stories of our Anzacs, our World War I uh, heroes uh, with their own memories, scanned images of, of something from their relative's life uh, or indeed just uh, little stories to populate um, that register. That's empowering citizens in a way where they can take ownership of their, their history but what the archive has provided is a, is a forum which gives them permission to do so and allows them to share it with the rest of essentially the rest of the world. Um, mapping our Anzacs is attracting a lot of attention because it's seen as brave. How do you, how do you open up a national collection that is an institution governed by some of the most rigorous 
rules of record keeping, as you would hope and as you would expect, how do you open up what they do just to the whole world, essentially, and, and invite people to be a part of that history? Well, the wonderful thing about the archive in Australia is that they've given themselves permission to do just that. And they are leading, I think, many of our national cultural institutions in what it is to take um, what is perceived as a risk and why, to date, um, there has been nothing except extraordinary accolades and wonderful participation in that initiative. So, to me, that is about placing and valuing the citizens' contribution to how we represent ourselves in a very, very public way. And because it's the archive in a way that carries a level of, of gravitas and authority that you would expect with such, a, such an institution charged with such important responsibilities as the record of the nation. Another, another point I'd like to, to make about citizen-centric services as one of the, the pillars of open government is that it, it really is about engaging the, the citizen um, in the process of service delivery. It's, you know, government departments can be extremely clever. And can I say, through the Gov 2.0 task force, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly, um, it really is about rewarding, capturing, showcasing, spotlighting the fantastic innovations that are occurring in the public sector and allowing those stories to proliferate amongst um, all spheres of government and hopefully be, be emulated, copied, um, mashed up in their own right and, and reinvented in, in innovative ways. Um, unless we ask citizens how and create environments where we can ask citizens how they want that to be done, we are um, uh, inhibiting our intellectual capacity as a nation to, to innovate in itself. And that really goes into my second uh, principle of open government, which is how you actually do allow innovation and collaboration to occur and use those tools um, to have that conversation. Um, the, before I move on to that, I will talk a little bit about the Gov 2.0 task force that, that was mentioned in the introduction. Um, the Gov 2.0 task force is the way in which the federal Labor government is trying to codify what it thinks it can do with Web 2.0 tools in government. It's, it's quite a challenge because at the moment it's a, an exciting conversation occurring in lots of pockets across the public and private sector in Australia, like here. But the government needed to be able to capture that and set an agenda. And one of the, the real challenges for the Australian government is we have very big federal departments that tend to function like silos. And ha managing IT across that and having uniform sort of principles and policies on something as, as groundbreaking and new as Web 2.0 social networking tools, um, it was all a bit too hard. And because it's, when things are hard in government, it's easier not to do anything. So I was absolutely thrilled to see my colleagues set up this um, Gov 2.0 task force because it created a, an input to Cabinet on a bunch of policy ideas that weren't going to come up through the departments and agencies because of that, you know, the risk averse culture that I, I certainly know and understand well, but also the fact that it was never going to be um, something that could be organised across a range of departments and agencies with enough momentum. So the political solution to breaking that nexus is to have for the minister to commission external advice, essentially through this task force. But he was pretty smart about how he did it. And the Gov 2.0 task force is a blend of both public and private sector leaders in the area of digital innovation. And I think the strength of that initiative lies in the fact that it's not, um, it, it's trying to draw in the best of the best in the public sector and the best of the best that we have in the private sector in the area of, um, of Web 2.0 innovation and people who've demonstrably led the way in both public and private areas with their own innovations in the digital space. That task force reports in December. Their, their brief is rapid, which has come to us with a whole series of, 
of excellent ideas that we can implement immediately and come to us with some um, exciting examples of what we would like to be doing in the future and we will shine a spotlight. We will fund small projects as part of the initiative and we will generally give it a, um, a much bigger profile than is currently the case. So as a policy response to a growing sense of urgency about where government should be going, I think the Gov 2.0 task force was pretty much not a, you know, the, the best model you can come up with relatively, relatively um, smartly. Um, for innovation facilitation, um, and this is all, I, I guess, um, part of this um, second pillar of open government, um, Gov 2.0 task force methodology is designed to, to be an example of, of what we mean by that. And using a digital environment and whatever tools you have at your disposal, in their case they are using a website with um, a series of blogs and, and comments and responses as well as public events, um, to try and um, collate um, the ideas and initiatives that are already out there and, and lay them out for all to see um, and promote them. I think that the use of spatial data, uh, and I was at an event last night um, that was um, celebrating the release of a new report showing the economic contribution that freeing up spatial data um, collected by governments can make to your economy on the back of both public and private innovation. Um, how we use spatial data is um, a great platform for innovation facilitation. And finally, um, that's a reasonable segue into the third pillar, which is about open and transparent government. So just to focus a little on open. <coughs> What's happening in Australia at the moment is that there's been a decision at cabinet level that we are going to change essentially the default position of government in relation to public sector information. And the, the vision for that has been expressed by our special minister for state, who's also our cabinet secretary and the minister responsible for agencies, uh, such as our freedom of information commissioner our Privacy Commissioner and our Commissioner for the National, um, and our Minister for the National Archive. And his view is that the government ought to make everything public unless there is a reason not to. Now, it kind of, it's like, well, of course that's the case because in theory, any citizen can ask for information and unless there's a reason to hide it, they'll get it. But when you take into account the complexities and costs associated with the Freedom of Information Act, which is the formal means by which to get stuff that isn't generally automatically made available, pushed out by agencies and departments, it's actually a profound barrier. So this policy statement in itself, to me, changes everything. It's, it's challenging to implement, but at least I can tell you I've got a reasonable grip on the the policy tools and shifts that need to be made to achieve the vision now that it's been expressed at the political level. So for the Australian government, a uh, default position of openness of public sector information is a wonderful place to be um, as we're coming into government uh, after a long period of opposition. I've often said that the time for most dynamic and fundamental change in public policy is at a point of change of government. It's when things are most fluid. Uh, and I think that um, this is a very good example of changing some of those entrenched approaches to how we manage information. So Minister Faulkner, um, who is sadly now the Minister for De Defence, but I can celebrate the fact that Senator Ludwig has taken his place and is equally committed to these principles of openness, have set about looking at the the stage-by-stage -stage processes we need to go to to make that a reality. And I'd just like to run through some of them. And these initiatives are, uh, some are underway and as I said, some require more work. But one of the, one of the things, um, one of the initiatives that is underway is reform uh, of our freedom of information legislation. 
to try and reduce the cost and reduce the complexities of getting access to information that would otherwise um, would otherwise be, be publicly available. There's no reason for it not to be available. Um, this involves a, a change in the thinking and management, particularly of electronic records keeping within agencies and departments. And this is where the policies of the National Archive in promoting a, an open standard, as they have done for many years now, in um, the statutory requirements on agencies and departments in how they archive their records, can be pushed back into departments to help them manage the process of being more open with information as it's generated and as it ought to be provided. You can appreciate that openness of and digitisation of archival records is a, is a secondary step to departments and agencies making policy decisions within their, their organisations to place more material online and to have effective systems of making material available in a digital format to facilitate ease of access. Um, the Information Commissioner Bill is also before Parliament at the moment and as yet defined, undefined the role, the full role of the Information Commissioner. I believe this, this role uh, of this person uh, will be quite central into helping guide agencies and departments in the implementation of their policies to make their material more accessible in a digital environment. Um, the other initiative that is very important, I need to spend a little bit of time on this in the spirit of openness, is that is the availability of the, the digital representations of our cultural collections. This is a, um, a very dynamic debate and discussion going on in Australia at the moment and we do have a budget initiative that's funding the next round of the business case for the Digital Deluge Project, which is designed to look at um, the sorts of common standards across our collecting institutions, the National Library, the National Film and Sound Archive, the National Archive, etc., and how we make those, um, uh, those cultural collections available to all Australians in a digital environment. And critically, and we haven't resolved this yet, in an environment where the copyright treatment is permissive, perhaps using a um, Creative Commons style licensing, um, rather than the restrictive copyright definition, or in worst case scenario, things that are out of copyright, but an additional layer of restrictive copyright is placed on those digital collections by virtue of the fact that they were digitised. It's kind of, oh, how did that happen? Um, and it, it seems to me to defy the whole purpose of the exercise um, on the one hand, making the collection more available and in a digital environment, but on the other hand, making it so hard for anybody to, to use that it kind of is self-defeating. Um, and no one can tell me that proliferation of those images in any way, um, in any way at all, does damage to the status of the collection. In fact, I, I s apply a simple test, and that is if it's the interest of all the great galleries of the world to put the most famous painting on their promotional material, then it seems to me that you, the more you replicate or the more you proliferate uh, the digital image, the more you add value to the original artefact in the original collection. And that's a wonderful principle to keep in mind in contemplating policies of um, how digitising and um, making those collections more available in that, in that way. Um, there have been some wonderful innovations with the Smithsonian. In fact, using an open collaborative environment to develop their um, digitisation policies so we can all learn from that, including Australia needs to learn from those examples. We have some great thinkers in that regard, as I'm sure you do here. It's a matter of now of instituting actual change and leading by example. I think this is an area, and I'm hoping this is an area that the Gov 2.0 task force will focus on specifically. Um, so that was that's an example of, of I think how openness um, really needs to can become real, as opposed to a principle that we all know well and, and espouse. Um, Open standards are uh, absolutely critical. I describe open standards as taxpayers' insurance against inefficiencies and cost blowouts in the future. It's, it's essential. We, we cannot go forward as a nation and not have open standards because we would be deliberately incurring uh, a, a liability that is potentially unsustainable and that would be extremely poor public policy indeed. 
especially times when resources are tight. Um, but I, I don't think I need to pepper my presentation tonight with the economic arguments. They are all there, uh, as I'm sure we're familiar with. Um, as far as transparency goes, I, I actually think it's important to understand the difference between transparent and accessible government and um, um, transparent and accountable politicians. Um, I think one of the, the barriers to innovation in this area is that the line is a little bit fuzzy between what I do to make myself more accountable using Web 2.0 style tools and what you might do as a government agency or department to better serve your citizens. Um, I think it's important to have that conversation at a policy level so agencies can proceed um, understanding fully their obligations in relation to service to citizens and that not being confused as to how politicians set about having a more quality conversation or interaction using a digital environment with the people they represent. It's like a, a demarcation that I sense is going to create a, a complexity and potential barriers to some real innovation in this regard. So I just want to throw that one up the flagpole at the moment to um, I think, um, well, apart from anything else, allow me to talk about that, that second issue, and that's accountability of an e-democracy. Um, I think that the way in which we, uh, and I as an elected representative, serve my citizens um, needs to improve. Um, it's an easy thing to say, and I don't think there's too many people who are elected who wouldn't want to find better ways to communicate with the people they represent. Um, the internet uh, provides an extraordinary medium in that regard. And I'm really pleased to be able to continue what is a series of essentially experiments about my conversation with the people I represent. Um, the conversations I, I want to have are about policy and um, policy development. And I want to be able to respect uh, my constituents' um, intellectual contribution to good policy ideas. And I want to be able to um, give them meaning uh, in a way that has not been possible before. Um, this, this approach led to um, trying to create a forum um, that, that allowed this using the new tech tools. Now, I know some of you at least know Pia War, who's been active in the open source community for many years. I met her earlier in the year at a bar camp of all places, and she's now on my staff. And together we created a, a forum called a public sphere that we were able to put some of our ideas about how we would put technology, Web 2.0 technologies, to use to improve the conversation between me and the people I represent. So I'd like to conclude with just a bit of an explanation about how that public sphere um, event worked. Um, and it will give you, I guess, an insight into some of our thinking um, across all of these, these pillars of open. Because we decided ultimately that we could talk about this an awful lot, but until we started actually doing things, um, people wouldn't be able to see um, the results and for us we wanted to you know have a bit of a play ex continue the experiment in online engagement so the public sphere goes like this there is a day uh, where everyone gets together and, and talks and we video stream and we we collect um, all of the transcripts from that and the conversations but the public sphere um, extends weeks before and weeks after the most important thing in setting up a policy consultation using uh, Web 2.0 tools was to make sure that there was a beginning, a middle and an end. Without an outcome, it just was another talk fest with your local politician. Unless we had some formal structure around the event and people could see the result and see where it went and there was some accountability associated with the time that we all spent on it, we felt that the exercise would be devalued. We also felt very strongly that every step of the way of hosting such a policy conversation had to be open and to be completely transparent. 
we're asking people to give a lot of their time and their effort and they needed to be confident that this was just not another politician having another talk fest and um, um, going through the motions of engagement and, and I don't need to tell you that there's, um, there is always at least some cynicism amongst um, the community about um, the nature of political engagement with constituencies. Um, I, should, I should also say in putting that forward is that the vast majority of the time the motivation is truly genuine. It's the methodology that lets us down. So in deciding, in deciding the methodology for a public sphere, we wanted people to essentially self-nominate self for participation. But we also felt that the, the topic had to be sufficiently focused to make sure that it was a, an outcome were possible. So the first one we did was on higher bandwidth networks. And we opened up um, um, my, my website, a blog environment for people to pitch up their ideas about what they would like to present and the, the, the core of the policy idea that they wanted to put on the table and, and test in, in that group. Um, the event itself, um, we then would um, use that to try and structure a program around and ultimately there'd be lots so we'd have a rapid fire presentation which we live streamed. At the actual physical event like, like this, we'd be streaming and we would have uh, a Twitter feed running on that as well using our hashtag as the event identifier as well as my blog and comments running off the blog. We would capture all of that and then the task was to try and draw out of all of that data all of that information, the presentations, the comments, the feedback, the Twitter feed, um, a document that captured the essence of those ideas. We then placed that on a wiki and for the next two weeks, participants in the event would go back and edit the wiki and knock it into shape. At the end of that process, we would close off the wiki and have another uh, process by which people could go back in and essentially endorse um, prioritised to a degree, but essentially endorse the recommendations that emanated from that body of, of collective work. Again, an open process. And uh, we did that last part because we felt with the wiki being completely open, there needed to be a, a final system of peer review on the outcomes. And finally, and absolutely critically, we would identify through the course of this how to plug this into government thinking. What was the right channel in the government and which portfolio of the day to feed this policy input in that had been completely transparent and open, absolutely drawing on the wisdom of the crowd and then presenting it to government and have it valued. Well, this is where the, I think the support of my colleagues has been quite critical to the success of public spheres because there's been a lot of interest in the process and they've been waiting there with open arms saying, please give us the input. And we, we most recently delivered the outcome of our second public sphere on Gov 2.0, which is a bit circular because we had a methodology and a topic that was all about the same thing. Um, and we presented that formally to the Gov 2.0 task force, who will now take that into formal account as part of their considerations. Um, and finally, we have um, on the public sphere, uh, we have our third one, um, in fact, on Friday this week, in Wollongong and we're trying a few new processes in that regard including having some uh, virtual hubs in Brisbane and Melbourne and the topic being the ICT sector and creative industry sector and industry growth. Um, the public spheres um, have attracted a lot of attention because for the first time in, in having social media tools used to make sure the event is not just who's in the room but also able to be um, permanently recorded and reviewed so that the conversation continues well after the, the day finishes, has enabled people to add their thoughts in a considered way. And we feel that it's a good example of how you can genuinely tap into the wisdom of the crowd in a way that's completely open, but organised enough to get a collective expression of view coming out of the other end you know, it, it, that's presented in a way that is digestible by the government of the day. 
and that the politics surrounding the public sphere and the interest in, in using this kind of methodology has meant that the government has wanted to hear what the public spheres have had to say. Um, we, we like to think that the public sphere has um, removed the, uh, a lot of the sense of trepidation surrounding um, such openness in policy consultations uh, and indeed um, the use of the Web 2.0 tools where there is a great deal of trust placed in participants. We do ask them to identify. We do fully moderate uh, the, the blog, for example, um, and we do rely on people to participate with, um, with goodwill, and they do, and they have, and I, I hope that will continue to be the case because it's, it's taking us somewhere new. So finally, um, I hope I've at least given you a bit of a, a, a taste of where things are at in Australia. Um, can I wrap up by saying this is not something a single portfolio of government can do. Um, I, the, the work that's been done with ICT and where we need to go is across no less than six major portfolios. I've mentioned a few of them already. The Department of Finance and Deregulation has the Office of, of Government Information Management within it um, and Steward and it's the Minister for Finance that has been the primary driver of the Gov 2.0 task force. Secondly, uh, the Special Minister of State in his stewardship of not least the National Archive, the Freedom of Information, the Privacy Commissioner and soon once the bill passes the Information Commissioner. There's also our Broadband and Communications and Digital Economy Minister. Now his job is of course is to build us that network, please, uh, and also to drive a strategy forward on digital economy futures, which is really the multitude of um, sectoral involvement in the, the types of industries and economic growth we can derive from um, um, essentially the high-tech industries and services and processes um, across almost every sphere of our existence. Um, fourthly, the Department of Innovation and Industry. So, you know, good old industry department. Um, pretty focused on everything green at the moment, including a very recent announcement about investing in green ICT at startup and venture capital investment level. Um, that department is always important because they hold the, uh, the keys to the, the broad industry, um, broad industry support for um, companies from, from start-ups, uh, the cooperative research centres, which are collaborations between public and private institutions and companies, um, right through to um, the overarching investment in our tertiary institutions, which as you're probably aware are all publicly, pretty much all publicly funded in Australia. And so their research and development budgets become <laughs> critical determinants in our overall ICT capability. Um, and so what have we got there? We've got Finance, Special Minister of State, um, Broadband Digital Economy, indus Industry and Innovation, two more, Education, I mentioned $12.4 billion in the digital education revolution, again critical to the investment and rolling out services online, um, for education services, and finally health. Um, we are in the midst of an e-health strategy, um, we haven't seen what comes out at the end of it yet, but there's a, a great deal of um, conversation and interest and significant investment um, by the health department in what e-health e will look like, including on our high bandwidth network and the use of, of um, telepresence and, and, and the sort of video, video conferencing style that we like to use to demonstrate what, it, what a high bandwidth network means to an isolated community who we can't afford as a country to provide the full range of health services on their doorstep. It becomes very meaningful if you have telepresence. And that's just a taste. So it's, it's never one portfolio. That's why it needs political leadership from the top and um, why I like to think it needs um, enthusiastic backbenchers like me to keep it all rolling along. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kate. That was a, a wonderfully um, broad vision of uh, how governments can uh, uh, work with communities to um, get better use out of technology. 
I've seen you uh, online, but it's so much more compelling to have, have the real thing in the real room. So I'm not quite completely sold on the digital revolution as being the only method of communication. Um, we've probably got about another 25 minutes, so I'll ask Vikram to make some quick thoughts from the point of view of New Zealand uh, government administration, then we'll open up the floor to discussions and questions. Thank you for that. I'll try to keep it brief, but I guess the idea was that we've heard uh, this very broad Australian perspective and to enable a discussion for us to try to think about some of this from a New Zealand context, um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on uh, talking a little bit about what's happening with the New Zealand government. Now, my perspective is much narrower, so I work for the State Services Commission and that means my perspective at the moment is uh, government agencies and doesn't include uh, politicians. Uh, so in terms of a framework for w what I wanted to talk about, um, it was basically about revolutions. And um, I did consider landing up in my jeans and, and a T-shirt and uh, talking about revolution. But the point is that that's not the kind of revolution that I wanted to talk about. Uh, so I think the, 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 you know, the Che Guevara and the Castro, they're, they're very last century stuff. So I landed up in a suit because the, the uh, revolution I wanted to talk about was the civic revolution. And part of the problem that we have is that we live in a time when revolutions are overlapping. And so we don't quite recognize sometimes that we're in the middle of a revolution. So the first revolution that has happened and is happening is the technological revolution where if you're on the right side of the digital divide, um, the technology, the computers, the bandwidth, they're okay, they, you know, we today at, the, at a desktop or a laptop have so much more computing power and the tools and the skills that it, it's a huge revolution even from a few years ago. The second revolution that happened uh, effectively is a social revolution. So once we had these uh, technical tools, we had people participating in uh, social networks, and over the last few years, they have had an opportunity to understand what does two-way dialogue look like, um, how do you form communities of interest that are not separated uh, by distance anymore. And they've also set expectations that people uh, want to participate and have the ability to participate and are looking for ways to participate. So I think open government um, is the third aspect, which is a civic revolution, which builds on the previous two revolutions. And I think that's important for us to keep in context because um, a lot of the systems, the structures, our mindset, our culture is based on effectively an industrial revolution design. So the nature of representational democracy makes sense when you think about it's really, really hard to get a number of people uh, together to discuss and have a debate and to think about the trade-offs and make a decision. Um, and those were the barriers that led to us designing systems and structures that we have today. Um, yet the revolutions that we are seeing today are doing away with those barriers and they're putting up new barriers such as attention, uh, such as uh, a sense of civicness and social duties. Um, so sometimes people have described what we've got today is a vending machine um, government. So uh, you put in the money and you know what you're gonna get out. So if you lose a job, you expect to be able to go to a government office, pull a lever and get some benefits coming out from it. But we need to recognize that uh, the, the essence and the fundamental shift is occurring. And that's what I meant by the civic revolution. It is a, fun it is a change in the fundamental relationship between the state and the citizens. So the question is, um, how are we doing? And um, I think what's happened is that a lot of talk about open government has talked about government 2.0, which is unfortunate in some ways because it sets a mindset of us thinking about web 2.0 and web 2.0 tools. So if we were to look around today around government agencies, uh, I'd say there's a fair usage of web 2.0 tools today already. 
So uh, blogs are fairly common. Uh, wikis are being used quite a bit. Uh, there's some good Twitter streams. So I think the Ministry of Health using Twitter for the swine flu updates has, has gone down quite well, or the company's office using Twitter. Uh, some of the mashups that have been interesting is, for example, the Google Earth layer that uh, Tourism New Zealand has put together, which is quite influential. And then there's, of course, there's things like YouTube and Facebook and Flickr, MySpace. There's also some, uh, some work being done around open data, open standards, open source, and those are all important aspects. Uh, so Statistics New Zealand has been making a lot of its statistical information open for quite some time now. But these are tools. Um, briefly, and there's a few enablers that I just wanted to touch on. I think there's been some pretty good progress on um, licensing. And um, one of my colleagues will be shortly releasing a draft framework which uh, recommends that the Creative Commons be adopted as a standard suite of common licenses across government. And I think even more important than that, uh, the recommendation is that the default should be the most liberal, which is uh, attribution, BY. Um, some of the policies uh, instruments have been in place for a long time now. So the policy for government health information is already 10 years old, and to some extent um, provides a good platform for open accessible information. It was mentioned about um, the report that was launched yesterday around geospatial. And that's quite important because it starts setting out the economic logic of opening up government held data and information. And so it's quite powerful that last year, um, $481 million was the dollar amount that New Zealand lost due to lost productivity. Um, and the return is five is to one between investment and return on that. So at, if you think about um, some of the tools and some of the enablers, we're beginning to see some progress. But the realistic thing is this is all around the edges. Uh, this isn't business as usual for government agencies by any means. So effectively, it's a change management problem. And one of the issues that we could look at is, so how do we do this change management? Um, and possibly a good example is the US, where there's clear top down. So President Barack Obama, in his first presidential memo, set out his vision of a participatory, transparent, and collaborative government. That was his very first memo. And so that's a clear top-down strategy that we have going forward. Uh, another example, and we have several of these, is where you have some very good <coughs> sorry, um, task force and reports and stuff, and that's, that's interesting. But if we look at what's happening in New Zealand and maybe some of the lessons that we can learn from our history, um, one of the ones that I found really interesting was Kate Shepard. Um, and that's because it's a local name and not too far. But if you think about what she did, and this is particularly in regard to New Zealand being the first country in the world to give women the right to vote. Um, it was, the law went up three times to parliament, uh, 1878, 1879, and 1887, and all three times it was voted down. Uh, Kate, Sh Kate Shepard spent a lot of time, um, she created the WCTU, which is the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and um, quite grassroots civic movement. And because we've had a petition and a referendum recently, worth noting that back then, uh, she got one fourth of all uh, female European residents of New Zealand to sign the petition, which is quite an achievement given the barriers at that point. Um, in 18, 1893, New Zealand did pass the first law allowing women to vote and hell has not frozen over. Um, you know, things have still worked quite well. Those, I guess some would argue that we're still a long way away from gender equality. But the fact is that uh, there are different types of change management techniques. Uh, open down, uh, top down is always nice. Bottom up also works. And um, picking up a little bit on what Lawrence said was that this process of fundamental shift, uh, which is really the relationship between the citizen and the state, it's too important to leave the government alone. Um, it's a hard job, it's a big job, and I think one of the things that we'd particularly be keen on is to understand how do we make the shift, and it's just too important and too hard to leave the government alone. Thank you.
That's a great segue. Thank you, Vikram, because we've heard from the politician and we've heard from the public servant, and now we're going to hear from somebody who's neither. Brenda, do you want to give us a few thoughts based on what's been said so far? And then we'll open the floor for questions. All right. Um, I'm six months pregnant, so if I stop suddenly, it's because the baby kicked me and I lost all my thoughts. Okay. Uh, I just had three thoughts here. Um, Kate mentioned the F Official Information Act, which we have here too, which is a wonderful thing. There's some data you want. You can use the Official Information Act, and hopefully you'll get it, as long as it's not a treaty on counterfeit Prada bags or something. You can usually get it. Um, the problem is you need to know that it exists. If you don't know the data set exists, you, you can't go get it. And if you do know that it exists, you need to know who has it. And if you don't know who has it, or you think you know who has it, but they don't think they have it, but they think someone else has it, but they send you there and back and forth and back and forth, you can't get it. Um, I'm reminded here of an Aucklander named Anita Keane recently tried to get data on elevation of streets. So if you're a cyclist, you can choose to not to take the longer route, but go around the hill instead of over it. And she went to like dozens and dozens of the little city councils around Auckland. They all knew it existed. They just didn't know who owned it. They didn't know if it was a contractor, if it was a city council. So she can't get this data because no one will admit owning it. So it's a wonderful thing, but it's very, we need more than the Official Information Act. We need to know what data is where and who owns it. Um, the other thought I had was public sphere is, I love the idea of public sphere. Do we have an equivalent here of public sphere? Nothing. <laughs> we've got the we've got the embryo on um, open .gov, embryo. open .org .nz. Awesome. Um, so there is there is uh, we're starting to talk about who knows what data sources are there, and we're starting to have some discussions. But it still needs still needs more active participation. Open .org .nz. Okay, so that, that's for data. So public sphere is more than just data. It's about process, government, and getting things online that aren't currently online. Um, oh, can we have one here? That would be totally awesome. Um, it, it's come from um, Kate in Australia and her team. Um, who would it come from here? Um, if it was coming from a politician here, um, you'd think they'd be in the room today, but there haven't been any turn up, have they? Damn. OK. <laughs> We have to find someone to second into that. My third thought I had is um, I keep hearing everybody mentioning Obama did this, Obama did that, and every time I hear it, I think, why did Obama beat us to it? Why is it New Zealand opening things up faster? Why do we have to have an example somewhere else before we're willing to do it? And I'd love for us to start beating Obama to doing awesome open things. Thanks. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Brenda. Um, just on the politician side of things, uh, one of the, the principles under which Govis operates is that it's, uh, it doesn't involve domestic politicians. So uh, maybe the next time we'll do this, we'll do this with, um, with a community organisation. But Govis did do some great legwork to get this put together. So thank you very who much, you know Govis. Who, who the politician would be? Um, well, I'd like to open that up to the, up to the floor, actually. Um, 